So just as a brief introduction, my name is Chinmoy and I'll be presenting the session for you, which is a one hour session divided into four small parts. At the first, I'll just have a brief intro about excavation. Then the second part will be a brief intro of GTS Annex. And then we'll discuss the problem statement and go to the numerical model. And meanwhile, towards the end, you can have the Q&A. So meanwhile, if you have any particular questions that uh, you would like to be addressed, I'll request you to note uh, down the questions on the question panel. And uh, you know I'll be able to answer them one by one towards the end of the session. Okay. No. So. <coughs> so starting with a brief intro to excavations. So when we say excavation, what is an excavation? So as a as a definition or a scientific terminology to mean it is just the generic process of earth removal to form a cavity in the ground and any uh, excavation should encompass or encapsulate all the activities that involve the removal of either rocks or soil or plant debris or what we also called as stripping either by mechanical means or if the uh, track is quite narrow, sometimes, you know, jackhammers also do the job. And the main intention is either reuse of the material or any further construction on the excavated zone. Excavation can be classified based on different characteristics of the excavation. So basically the type of material or the objective of the excavation so on a broad scale excavation can be classified into two different types first by type of the material excavated the topsoil excavation or what we also call as topsoil stripping then earth excavation it can go deep then the rock excavation either the outcrop rock or the outcrop of a hill or if let's say the Top surface is a rock or muck excavation. Muck excavation is basically done where the water level is quite high and the soil is of horrible quality. So in the material from muck excavation cannot be reused for anything. It has to be dumped somewhere. So basically it's like excavating either clay or highly cohesive soil or silt. And then some can also be termed into the unclassified uh, types. And then coming to the purpose of excavation. So if we classify the excavation based on the purpose they solve, first is the cut and fill excavation. It is quite uh, evident and you might have seen it in the urban areas. So <clears throat> especially where let's say a uh, subway station have to be built, some Sometimes we dig uh, the area and then it is backfilled along the precasted uh, segment and liners. And then trench, uh, basically trenching are thin, uh, <clears throat> low width, but the depth may vary. It can go to higher depths too. So either for pipelines or cables or you know underground uh, water supply systems, or you know they may solve a multitude of uh, purposes. Then third is basement excavation, which is quite common uh, in the urban area. Fourth is excavation for road. Fifth is excavation for dredging. So dredging essentially is in the high seas. Then finally, it is the over uh, excavation. Now coming to a few geotechnical issues associated with excavations. So what kind of geotechnical issue we can think of? Well, a lot of things can go wrong if we are, uh, you know, if you are using geosciences and our study or our interpretation of the particular science is not 100% complete. So I used the word complete, I did not use the word accurate because it is very hard to 100% uh, you know, replicate the ground behavior. 
so what we can do is we can try to approximate the best or the worst possible outcome if not you will end up with something as shown in the pictures like on the top left picture if i just uh, show you <clears throat> you can see a part of the road embankment has collapsed along with the retain and taking the retaining wall uh, with it similarly in the bottom you can see a continuous uh, board pile wall with extremely good uh, backup support system of bailing and anchoring yet you can see along the corner where the machine or the uh, excavator is standing <clears throat> the area has completely failed now this particular image is indication of two things first and the foremost thing is that uh, the excavations need to be planned very carefully and meticulously second this example is the classic example of why we would need a 3d analysis to support our vision because you see this thing failed in the corner so to prevent this effect of extra stresses concentrating on the corner we need to go for the 3d analysis and then take a look at how the stresses are getting accumulated and also how the wall elements or the support elements are behaving according to the prevalent ground conditions so this is the main reason why i showed this particular picture because this is the indication of how a 3d analysis need to be done or why a 3d analysis need to be done and not to mention here it is a we can say that uh, these contractors are a bit lucky that there is no high-rise uh, apartment uh, complex uh, in the vicinity let's say if there was one then there might have been chance when the entire uh, complex uh, would have been uh, evacuated so these are certain issues which are uh, valid for excavations either in rural areas or in urban areas or let's say in unmanned areas too that one needs to be taken care of so with this part uh, being clear, we have finished the first part of the session. That was a brief uh, intro about excavations. Now I'll tell you a bit about GTS NX. Then we'll go to the problem uh, statement. So with GTS NX, first and the foremost thing for us will be to see the ground topography development. So for ground topography development, GTS NX supports a multitude of features. So you can either import your contour maps, solve stratigraphy data or borehole logs in DXF, DWG, parasolid format. And you can use either the point face option or the terrain geometry option, terrain geometry maker option to create a comprehensive face as seen on the bottom right picture. Now, the top left picture here is a contour map which can be developed into a proper topographical 3D uh, face in GTS NX with the use of uh, the inbuilt uh, geometrical tools. Otherwise, if you have a large area, which is also called as a stringed or a triangulated area, which is basically an output of either a GIS uh, software or let's say softwares like you know leaf frog or or minex or vulcan or sarpac in those cases you can also export these kind of large triangulated digitized string surfaces to gds and get done with your faces and actually civil 3d is also right now able to make uh, these kind of string faces for large uh, area distribution next you can import your total station points or you can also import points from google earth via the excel format and you can develop uh, the face right away with the aid of uh, the software automation tools as shown in the right uh, picture otherwise 
you can also import your LiDAR survey or Landsat survey data and you can get your DEM or digital elevation model. The digital elevation model is available in two formats. One is the uh, format where you get the elevation of all the points along the uh, survey area or DEM uh, face can also look like the previously shown triangulated uh, face. So both way it is possible and both of the things can be imported into GTS because right now instead of total station uh, drone uh, photogrammetry and LiDAR are taking uh, the front seat in terms of uh, surveying and uh, you know automation and data uh, image processing. In those cases, those inputs uh, can uh, provide a comprehensive uh, <coughs> a comprehensive uh, you know development of a face in GTS, which can then be meshed and you can continue with your analysis case in here. Then after your soil uh, topography or the ground topography has been developed in GTS, the next thing will be to create your borehole uh, layers. So for that, we have the bedding plane wizard where all you need to do is just uh, input the layers uh, depth and you can get your borehole distribution looking like this so if we imagine or we take a concept from the field and we want to deduce that in a reality it will appear something like this the first we took up a concept and then we mapped the necessary area and then using the automation features uh, provided in the software, we can have a comprehensive 3D model looking like this. Next, the interoperability of GTS NX. So any software, it should be able to be compatible with, uh, with any structural platforms. So fortunately, in our case, GTS is extremely compatible with uh, inputs from Midas Civil and Midas Gen. So here you can import your entire bridge or your apartment uh, complex or your plant or a transmission tower, anything that is a structure uh, in uh, uh, that is a structural model along with all the loading conditions. They can be completely imported into GTS. And then you can go with the comprehensive ground analysis or the soil structure interaction. So if we secondly imagine the same concept of concept to reality, you can see for a structural foundation analysis, like in here, you can import it into GTS and you can see the effect of the structure on the existing ground. Same thing goes for the bridge uh, foundation analysis too. So now we'll see a uh, certain type of analysis types and applications uh, of uh, GTS. So GTS NX is basically uh, all in one FEM based accessometric 2D and 3D integrated platform for geotechnical analysis. So in the very same software, you can do all three accessometric 2D and 3D. So in terms of the analysis types, you can start with the static analysis. So a non-linear static or a linear static. Then for slope stability, we have the stealth reduction method or the CFI reduction method. We have the LEM or the limit equilibrium method. Then we have the construction stage um, for slope stability. For example, if you are excavating a hillside and with excavation, your factor of safety changes and you want to take a look at, you know, various deformations of the slope along with the slope factor of safety, you can go with the construction stage methodology for the slope stability. Then we have the dynamic analysis. So here you have the eigenvalue and response spectrum analysis, linear, nonlinear time history analysis, or a equivalent 1D or 2D linear analysis. And GTS also supports the stress seepage coupled nonlinear time history analysis plus slope stability SRM analysis. So basically, let's say if you have a dam or you have a 
uh, a coffer dam or a retaining wall and uh, you have let's say you know water flowing uh, from one head to the lower head or the, let's say you are dewatering your uh, uh, your excavation zone and then at that point of time let's say a uh, seismic uh, wave is acting in those cases you can do the nonlinear time history with the stress siftage coupled and you can check for the change in the ground behavior due to the earthquake uh, waves hitting the static uh, condition of groundwater draw drawdown. Then you can do the seepage analysis, <coughs> a steady state or a transient state seepage. So steady state is basically, let's say you have a retaining wall and uh, your groundwater is flowing from behind the retaining wall to your uh, excavation zone. And transient state seepage is basically, let's say you are lowering your groundwater level or you're having the groundwater drawdown uh, by the use of pumps or wells. In those cases, you can go for the transient uh, seepage. Next is the coupled analysis. So GTS supports both semi-coupled and fully coupled analysis. Then we have the consolidation analysis for soft ground. And uh, to support that, we have materials like soft soil, modified cam clay, etc. And finally, if we combine all of the analysis types, we will end up with the construction stage analysis. So we can do the drain and drain analysis, seepage uh, for each step, or a coupled analysis. Then you can also do the fully coupled analysis in the construction stage methodology. You can check for consolidation independently of each uh, stage if required. And you can also check for cons pre and post consolidation uh, slope factor of safety in using the construction stage analysis methodology in GTSMX. So now we take a look at a few of the uh, application uh, areas. So starting with tunnels, so you can do both 2D and 3D analysis in GTS as mentioned before. The top left picture where you have a portal with a fractured uh, zone or a shear zone on the longitudinal section or on the section of uh, your tunnel progression, you can go for a 3D analysis uh, using GTS NX. Otherwise, the combination of ventilation shafts plus access tunnels to the main subway system including the cross passage can be modeled or you can model uh, something like a shield tbm progressing through the urban areas so cities so like uh, singapore or kuala lumpur or manila or mumbai mainly southeast asia the urban areas are still expanding so tbm is the preferred uh, use of uh, use of choice for tunneling so in those cases, you can go for the complete analysis of uh, the ground uh, behavior and the structural behavior based on the uh, you know the progression of your shield TBM. Otherwise, for a tunnel in a hill, you can go for the uh, <clears throat> the steel pipe reinforced step grouting, and you can see here the. Uh, tunnel has a very varying overburden. The overburdens are different at the portals and it has lowered uh, due to the valley depression just at the middle of uh, the tunnel. Then you can also check for the construction of uh, two new TBM tunnels below an existing NATM tunnel, which is below the basement of a high rise uh, tower and uh the presence of uh, you know the bridge uh, foundation elements as shown in here so the main study that was done in this model was to check for what kind of extra stresses are developed or what is the externally induced shear zone or plastic zone around the foundation piles and also the uh, pile caps for the bridge foundation due to creation of the new up and down uh, tunnels then uh, you can go for the uh, subway tunnel with four polling or crown improvement. So next is excavation and temporary structure, since this is something 
we are going to cover today. So you can go for either a diaphragm wall or a contiguous pile board pile wall or a sheet pile wall or you know you can check for the impact assessment uh, for your uh, existing infrastructure due to the construction of uh, your let's say subway system or a basement uh, for high rise uh, tower then for foundation you can go for a simple raft footing or a pile uh, raft foundation or a uh, well foundation Then for ground improvement, uh, you can do the breakwater analysis or the soft ground improvement using prefabricated uh, vertical drains or uh, sand drains, then revetments or quay walls, or otherwise stone columns as shown in here with the 3D model. So this is uh, the chart you are seeing here is uh, the long-term settlement uh, chart uh, due to the loading uh, uh, imposed by the hydrocarbon tank. Then the slope stability analysis, the C5 reduction method. Then the LEM method. The chart you see here is the chart for uh, your uh, slope stability uh, analysis using LEM for different operational conditions of the of an earthen uh, dam. So the first part you can see the factor of safety is quite high because these are normal operating conditions. Then the factor of safety starts dropping in the rapid drawdown scenario. So if I just change my pointer to a pen marker, you can see this is the scenario of the rapid drawdown it starts from here and goes till here so in this range the factor of safety drops from around 2.2 to just 1.3 at the final stage of drawdown so this is basically coupled analysis where you go for the uh, the water drawdown from the upstream side and you check for the upstream slope stability and then you we have applied this hydrostatic uh, force in here and in pseudostatic the factor of safety drops from around 2.2 to 1.6 then result of seepage analysis so you will have a phreatic lines as shown in here this is the example of acceptable or a good phreatic line, which means water is flowing from the inside of a soil matrix or a dam as it should. Then if we have water flowing like this along the dam embankment, then yes, we have a problem, which essentially means your dam is not functioning as a dam anymore. Due to the, that region, the slope is quite high and the dams are made of earthen materials. So, which essentially means that that high pore pressure along with the uh, external or ex excessive seepage as a result will also lead or also might cause liquefaction of the core material. And if this is the second case, so case one that is acceptable case case 2 not acceptable case 3 is piping or piping developed due to internal erosion so you can see this total height here of the dam is around 120 meters and this fall this side is 90 meters so if the water falls to a height like this you can only imagine what is going to happen the water will develop piping and you will have either blowout blowouts along the downstream or sinkhole formation so these are basic you know engineering interpretations which you can deduce out of gts so the shoulder movements of a dam and the liquefaction for your lines 
factor of safety variation. Finally, for mining and geotechnical engineering, 2D or 3D open pit mines. Then your underground haulage road road plus cross cuts. You can basically call it as, you know, a labyrinth of uh, tunnels underground. Then uh, your waste storage, then dumps and stockpiles. So I hope uh, this is uh, the applications of GTS are clear for everyone. Next, we are going to check out the numerical model and then we'll go to the um, we'll go to the numerical model and the software demo itself. So in terms of problem statement, this is my excavation. The excavation is around 25 meters wide. Okay. And for excavation supports, we have five stage supports. One, two, three, four, five. So basically, whalers and studs are the support systems. And the entire numerical model looks like this. So the whole point of making the model big are there are two regions. First and foremost thing is your stresses and your plastic boundaries around the excavation should not reach the outer boundary because it will give you wrong results in uh, that case. Now, similarly, along with the lateral boundaries, the total boundary should also be deep enough. So in this case, it's around 50 to 75 meters. And we have also applied the interface element to simulate the relative slip between the uh, retaining wall or the diaphragm wall and the uh, soil. So there are two ways of, uh, there are multiple types of constitutive materials available for simulating this. But here we have chosen the more column for now. Then the modeling methodology. So first thing is you create the geometry or you import the geometry. In our case, I just imported the geometry. I, if you have a, a drafting team with you, it is always better to import your geometry. It works much more faster. Second is we define the material properties. So let's say for steel for concrete for soil and rocks we define the materials then we define the element attribute property either 1d 2d or 3d so here the ground elements are 3d the diaphragm wall is 2d and the strutting and the wheeling system are 1d elements then we define the mesh so you can have either uh Tetra mesh or hybrid uh, mesh in uh, GTS. So then we have the loading and boundary conditions where we apply either the static loads or the dynamic loads or any boundary conditions like your constraints or pinned supports or you know seepage boundary conditions. Then we do the analysis and finally the result. So, in terms of results, so what do we see? Here, our goal was to create the excavation, check for the excavation deformation, along with the impact assessment of local uh, areas. So, the one of the ways of doing that is by checking along the trend line what is the extent of deformation as you move far away from the excavation? So here you can see as we move far away from the excavation, the total settlement is around minus 0.37 mm, minus 0.4, minus 0.10. So and the values are in mm. 
so we can say that we have designed in this case only not this not applicable for every case that in this case we have designed a very sturdy support system that prevents the 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 soil in the vicinity to be getting extra stresses or the soil around the vicinity is not getting extra shear use now uh, the forces on the wall they look like this the by forces i mean in this case it is the bending moment along the wall okay you can see the bending moment is extremely high along the corners isn't that what we saw at the very first of uh, in the beginning of this presentation that how that particular excavation failed along the walls. Then this is the total depth of the wall. And then the total deformation along the line. Then the actual load on the studs and the wheelers. And it goes without saying that most of the loads should be taken up by the strutting system. Wheeling system is more or less to ensure that the load is distributed uh, uniformly along the length of the wall element. So I believe uh, everyone enjoyed the presentation. Now we'll go to the software uh, demo. So this is the model result, but uh, since this is a big 3D model, it takes some time to run. But before going at the results, and this is the results I'm going to show you. We are just going to create our model ground up. So for that, I'll click on the drop down menu. Click on new. I'll create a 3D model. So the top uh, option is the ribbon menu. In the left, you have the uh, work uh, tree menu. You have the model or the inputs like geometry or your mesh, mesh control and your loading conditions. Then your boundary condition and then your analysis sets. And then your results. This is the work, work pane. So anything you do it will be visible in here. And in the bottom, you have the output pane. And one more thing uh, that is very interesting about GTS is the fact that it has a multi-tabbed uh, window. So you can open 10 different models and run 10 different models at the same time. But please do note it also depends on your computer's hardware uh, capabilities. So I'll now import my geometry so i'll click on import import cad file so we have a uh, we have multiple amount of uh, cad imports possible which i'll show you right away but you can also import that the dxf and dwg both 2d and 3d now in terms of cad imports you can import the uh, parasolids as six step igs catia versions then SOLIDWORKS or UniGraphics or Inventor files. So the range of import is quite huge. Here I'm going to import a Parasolid uh, file, this one. So you can see this is my numerical model. <coughs> my geometric uh, looks like this. OK, so if I go to the geometry drop down menu, if I hide the solids, you'll be able to see the reinforcement uh, system. OK. Yeah. 
like this. So, what I'll do is I'll remove a couple of things which I do not need in here. So the bottom one and then the top lines I don't need. So I prefer keeping a clean geometry as long as uh, possible. So which is why I prefer only keeping the items which you know I find absolutely necessary only to retain those and do and nothing else. So this is my support uh, frame. Okay, the whalers, then the struts. So basically, my geometric part has been imported completely. And then if I hide this, you can see my excavations wall. So barring these two, these are my main excavations. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So with a total excavation depth of 15 meters and width of 25 meters, length of 25 meters. So 25, 25, 15 is my actual excavation depth. And apart from that, my embedded depth of the wall will be five meters. Now the embedded depth of a wall depends upon a lot of factors like the width of the wall, the type of soil or, or rock which is there, the type of excavation. These are certain things and also there are codes where it has been, uh, they have defined certain country codes have clearly defined the minimum uh, required length of embedment. So, but again, uh, most of the government agencies are now becoming quite uh, open to uh, interpretations uh, from numerical models, be it finite element models or discrete element models. So in this case, the finite element model is what we are going to calculate. So <clears throat> the excavations and then the soil around it. Now, before going for the meshing, I need to define my materials. So either you can define your materials or you can also import your materials. Since I had told you that I have already run the model, so I have my mo uh, materials predefined. So GTS automation features of importing your material and element attributes helps you save a lot of time because we do not need to recalculate anything or we do not need to re-enter anything. Once the material have been defined, you can just import them from another model. So I'll go to property. I'll use the import option. So what I'll do is I'll just click on my model. And you can see everything has been defined here. So I'll just import all of them, drag and drop. Topsoil, medium sand, dense sand, bedrock are my layers of soil. Valor struts, D-wall, and the base lab. I'll press OK. Now, here you'll see, since I only imported the property, but the properties have been derived from a material type. So along with the properties, the materials will also be imported. So I'll go to material. You can see this has been imported in here. Now to create a new material, we'll go to isotropic and you can select the model type or the constitutive model type. So we have the elastic uh, materials in here and then we have the von Mises, uh, Tresca and then uh, for soils, we have more column, Drocker Prager. For soft soil, we have the S clays, modified cam clay, soft soil, soft soil creep. For liquefaction uh, modeling, we have uh, your uh, UBC sand, North sand, PM4 sand, and bound model. For hysteresis soil models, we have hardened Renovich, Rambia Gosgut, or uh, Sekiguti Ota. 
and then for concrete or to simulate cracks in concrete we have concrete smear crack and concrete smear plasticity and for purely for excavations we have not only hardening soil with small strain stiffness we also have <coughs> we also have the modified more column and for rocks we have more column hook and brown generalized hook and brown and cwfs so cwfs means cohesion weakening friction uh, strengthening that is a long term uh, behavior of rocks in uh, excavations <coughs> so my top soil is of left 4 meters then my second layer is medium sand has a depth of 6 meters third is dense sand with a layer of around 7.6 meters fourth is fractured cyst with a depth of 12 meters and fifth is my highly weathered cyst that is a uh, depth of 20 uh, meters now <clears throat> Fractured schistose uh, rocks are extremely weak. So they possess very low bearing capacity and they sometimes they also need, uh, you know, like reinforcements. They come under the category of rock persists are one of the worst quality rocks which are available in the nature. So because systos basically means crystalline formations on existing rock. So it can be a metamorphic rock or it can be a sedimentary rock. Now due to these crystallizations, the <clears throat> rock inherently becomes very, very crystal, crystallized in format. And these are, these are notorious for, uh, for uh, chemical weathering and disintegrating due to water flow around it. So basically, cystose rocks or gypsum or limestone, they are not exactly <clears throat> the, I would say, an ideal scenario for any construction. They need deeper study uh, to uh, rectify or you know understand what kind of uh, behavior to expect uh, out of it. Now, with that being cleared, I'll just show you the property of the uh, di diaphragm wall. So it is a 150 mm diaphragm wall of concrete with the whalers looking having the section property of uh, a rectangle like this and the studs. So Or you can also, you know, create your own uh, properties. That is not a big issue. You can just go to section and create whatever section you want. We have a multitude of uh, properties. So uh, like uh, section properties like ASTM standards, the British uh, standards, or <clears throat> the Korean and the Canadian. This is the Canadian standard then the Indian standard. So in terms of section property definition, all you need to do is just enter your data in here. The stiffness uh, coefficients will be calculated by the software. So now what we do is we create the numerical model. So my model is here. Now I just create my numerical model now.
So starting with the meshing, what I'll do is I'll hide the outer solids okay. and also the one D elements. <clears throat> And I'll go to mesh 3D. So I'll select the size as one. So this is my excavation one. So I'll choose the layer as top soil. Okay, one, two, then I come to medium sand, three, four, okay, then from this layer it will be dense sand, or my sixth excavation is in dense sand, seventh is also in dense sand. Eight is into dense sand and ninth or the final. This is not an excavation layer. This is we have just created the block so that it's easier for us to extract the retaining wall. This will be my uh sister's rock. Press apply. Okay, so my excavations are now meshed. Next part will be meshing my so soil uh, elements so i'll click on the top soil and name it as s1 oh, 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 sorry my bad i should have given a bigger mesh size so first layer is s1 because the mesh size uh, should be uh, within the range of file to course, depending on what exactly are you looking for. So you can see it is quite fine along the excavation zones, but towards the boundary, it becomes more coarser. Then my second layer is medium sand. So I just name it as S2. Then my third layer is dense sand. My fourth layer is a rock. And so is my fifth layer. Now after this, we'll create our structural uh, elements. So we have only created the ground elements now. Time to go for the structural elements. I'll hide everything. And I'll go to mesh, extract. We'll go to top part. I'll extract the sides because we have already meshed them. So I just need to extract the elements to create my wall. Now, wall is a 2D element or a uh, shell element with a predetermined uh, thickness of around point, uh, point, uh, 0.15 meters or 150 mm. It can be even higher. So I name it as D wall. Like this. Now I hide the wall and I only activate the and this will be my formation of the base slab so just below the seventh excavation is our base slab so i select the property as base slab and i name it as base slab okay see now so my d wall and my base slab are complete now now I'll create my 1D structural elements. So for that, I just activate uh, my curves. And again, as I've told before, if you don't need certain things, feel free to delete them. I 
always that follow that principle it makes my job you know pretty easier that way so in this case i'll just delete these lines which i don't need i only need the framework here so that is what i'll keep like this or i can also delete the lines along the edges the this these ends i do not need them to so just delete them okay now we'll we'll now mesh these dots so we have to keep it in a view which is clear for us to understand and see properly now i'll go to only and i'll start selecting my objects okay like this so if it is sometimes hard for you to directly see you always feel free to rotate the objects you can either do it that way or the second way is just go to top view and hide the wheelers for now so that only these struts are visible right see only the starting layers are visible so here it is easier for us to select so i'll go to create only the number of divisions will be one i name it as s so my first layer being st1 st2 d 4 5 okay my starting is complete now the waiting systems so if i hide my mesh and I just go to top view and I ensure that only my veiling system is visible. I'll right click and press show only. You can see only the veilers are visible now. So I'll mesh them the very same way I did with the strutting. So I'll enter the division as one. So name it as veilers. Uh -uh. So this is W1, W2, W3, W4, W5. Okay. So you can see my starting wheeling system, my base slab, my diaphragm wall. Okay. Now we create the interface for the wall. So I will select the diaphragm wall. I will go to interface. And I will select as plane interface along the shell element. I'll select my shell element here. And since it is mostly sand, we take a, a strength reduction factor ranging from 0.6 to 0.75. And please do note, when we take nonlinear interfaces, they are also elements with nonlinear properties, which means they will have a finite stiffness. If that stiffness is breached, the model might diverge. So here I take a value of 0.7, press OK, and I'll press OK. It'll take a couple of seconds. You can see my interface. So my model input, uh, inputs are nearly there. I just need to define the boundary condition. So I'll go to static slope analysis, constraint, auto boundary, press Okay. So my model is built up and ready. I just define the construction stages now and I'll run the analysis. 
So I'll pan the model to the right, like you can see here. And I'll start defining my cases. So here in the bottom, you can see in the show data, there is nothing activated. So I'll activate my, I'll activate my five soil layers, my rigid link, and the exclamations. Then the boundary condition, then the loading condition. I'll press save. Now, please remember whenever you have interface, always use a rigid link because when the interface is not active, then the mesh nodes need to be connected by the rigid link. Otherwise, the model may, may or may not converge. So it is as a standard practice or SOP, it is always better to create an interface when, sorry, create a rigid link when interface element is created. So next, we install the wall. So with the wall comes the plane interface. So I activate the plane interface and then the diaphragm wall. Press save. Third will be my first excavation. So I deactivate the excavation wall. You can see here. Save. Then the excavation two. Same thing. I deactivate the excavation two. Press save. Then my first level of supports will be installed. So I'll activate the ST1, then the W1. For a more clearer view, let me just hide the interface. Okay. So it's a bit easier for you to see. Then excavation three after my first level of support. Okay. Then excavation four. Then the second support system. So W2 and starts. Then excavation five. On the deactivated segment. Then the third layer of support. Then excavation six is deactivated. Then the fourth layer of support, that is Valor 4 and ST4. Then the final excavation. Okay. And then the final layer of support then after everything is excavated we just install our base slab and we are done with the construction stage like this okay so then we just run the model now, the fun fact is GTS allows two kinds of mesh sets, the Tetra mesh or the hybrid mesh. So this model was created using the hybrid mesh, but the analysis results that we will be seeing is along the Tetra mesh. The main difference being that the hybrid mesh drastically reduces the total number of uh, elements required. You can see the total number of elements are around approximately 50,000. Now, if we take a look at the total number of elements in the Tetra mesh, you can see it is right now around seven times higher. So this is where GTS comes with the advantage that we post an analysis time that is at least 30 to 40 percent faster than any competitive software available in the market. Due to the sheer virtue that we are able to reduce the total number of elements by a factor of seven. So which is huge in terms of, you know, like time saving, but the results will be exactly the same. So. Coming down to results now for the wall stage. The total ground deformation due to installation of the wall is like this.
Western temples. Oh, So, this is excavation one. Uh, just a moment, sorry for the interruption. Yeah, we are back. So excavation one, then the second excavation, the total deformations. So in the excavation boundaries, you can see along the bottom, you might be able to see a bit of heaving. Then the TX and the TY translation. <clears throat> Just a moment, it's loading up. Some issue, uh, let's try to fix that. So the TX uh, translation along with the vectors. All good now. So let's say I just go to any random stage of support. I go to excavation five and I look for the action loads on the beam elements. They will look like this. Okay. So I'll just hide the uh, results for now. I mean, uh, the outer soil layers. So here you can see. So with the seek bar itself, you can see what is the change in the deformations or the forces along the entire length of the model. So along the base slab installation, if we see the forces now, you see the entire uh, distribution from top to bottom. So let's say I hide my soil base for now. Okay. 
you can see the forces on the wheelers and the struts. And again, if I hide all the wheelers, you'll see how the struts uh, take up maximum amount of the load. So this, since this is a big motor, it takes a couple of seconds for the results to load up. You can see here, if I use the value option, the maximum load is along the top and the bottom we go, the lower is the load taken up by the support system. So one can argue the bottom support system is not required. Yes, that is true. In this case, the bottom support system is not required because most of the load is taken up by the struts and the wheelers on the top. Similarly, if we want to see for the, the strains along uh, the excavations, if I go to solid strains, and check for shear strains. So we have the option called as the clipping plane, where you will be able to see in the middle of the model. So this is my exact range. So here you see, if I activate the origin, so my wall starts exactly at the origin. And here I know that until the length of 25 meters. This is my uh, excavation, okay? And this is the area where the excavation influences the local uh, site, okay? And it can be seen either from the X and also from the Y direction like this, okay? So the shear zone due to excavation is very close to the vicinity of the excavation. Approximately one or 1.5 meters. Beyond that, there is not much of a difference. So this is how the excavation looks like from the Y direction. And you can see the shear zone formation along the boundary of the wall and the uh, uh, retaining uh, uh, elements. So basically we can say that thanks to the support system in here and also thanks to the ground and ground material in here, whatever excavation was created, the entire impact is contained very close to the vicinity. So let's say I just pick up probing points and I want to see the ground uh, deformations. So this is, let's say, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. You can see the shear You can see the strains localization, the shear strains, the value is quite, quite low, which is which should be the case because the higher it is, the higher is the chance of collapse. Here we are getting around 1% shear zone close to the vicinity. And it is a good thing that there is a, a retaining wall which is able to restrict the movement of the soil. If the same number would happen anywhere near the new legends that we are creating, then this would have been a problem. So the impact assessment basically means how far is the spread of your uh, disturbed zone from the boundary. So which is clearly visible by using first the probe option and second the option of the, uh, the uh, clipping plane. So to take a look here, and I see it like this. So this is my total length of you know the area that is disturbed. So for today's session, 
this was what I had planned to show all of you. Now, if you have any questions, you know, please feel free to ask.